How is everyone doing tonight? <laughs> On Monday nights when I walk out, I say, good evening. No, no. Okay, so I need to train this crowd. Okay, so when I come out and I say, good evening, that means it doesn't matter what you've gone through. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it, right? Isn't that what the word says? All right. So when I say, good evening, good evening. praise God, because there is a word in the house, ladies. I am honored to stand in this place because last um, beautiful conference, I was in a hospital um, with my mom by my side. So I am happy to be here and thanking God for the year that I've had. To the speakers that we've had before, Hosanna and Joyce, who basically laid their hearts on the line and did not leave anything out there for us not to capture, I am so thankful and honored for what you did and setting the stage for this time and this moment. Kristen Bonham, your entire team, thank you. I am so excited to be here. Ladies, my mother is in the house. Mom, can you stand? I have to give honor where honor is due, and I honor my mom. My aunt is here. My daughter is here. I am the woman of God that I am because of that woman's prayers. And so I honor her in this place. So let me tell you a little bit about yourself. You know my name, but some of you know me, some of you don't. And so I have a picture of my crew on, um, on the, there's a picture here. And so there we are. I have been married in March. It will be 23 years to Alton Scott, and so I am so thankful. We have a daughter who is graduating this year. That is a lovely thing when you know they're getting ready to leave. And so I also have a fifth grader, and I always say, I don't know what happened and why there is six years in between my kids, but my little man, Jordan, um, who of course is not here, but I, I said, I'm not going to embarrass my daughter because she's here, so I am going to embarrass Jordan because he's not here. And so I show this picture to our Monday night crew Bible study, and if you're not in Bible study and you're not connected, you need to be. Um, and so anyway, on Monday night, I said, if I could just tell you one thing about my son, this is a picture where they had told each one of my mom's grandkids, look out upon the water. <laughs> Don't look at the camera, look out upon the water, and you see what Jordan did. And so tonight I am talking about just a little, I'm just going to share my testimony, right? And so what I hope is that you get some nuggets from my testimony. I love people. I love community. And so, Hosanna, when you said about community, I've been through some difficult moments these last few years. And so it is my community that has helped me in a tremendous way. I love people. I love talking. I have a twin sister. I believe we have a picture um, of my twin sister. Um, we probably talk four to five times a day. I'm sure you were thinking I was going to say a week. And so she does not live in town, and I say, I thank God because our marriages are still in existence because we don't live in the same city. And so I love to talk. I was often in trouble at school because of my mouth. And my mom is probably shaking her head. She got lots of calls from teachers. I was most outspoken of my high school class. I talked to my husband two to three times a day. I talked to my mom one to two times a day. I text my daughter, because that's how the young ones, that's how you got to talk 
to them is through text. And so I love people. I am an extrovert. I am not one who wants to be alone by myself. I was born with a playmate. <laughs> I love people. What can I say? And, and I'm sure it's the same for you with your best friend, right? If you think about your best friend or you think about your spouse and you want to spend that time, maybe, with your spouse and you get excited and you call your friend and you expect your friend to answer. But what happens when something changes? So my relationship with Christ did not start in a friendship type relationship. Jesus was my savior, my king. I grew up in the church. But in our house, your parents were not your friends. And so when I thought about Jesus, Jesus was not my friend. He was my father. And there was a big difference, and I reverenced and honored him. Now, as I have matured in my walk with Christ, I know that he is my friend. And if you look at this scripture from John 15, 15, it says, I have never called you servants because a master doesn't confide in his servants and servants don't always understand what the master is doing but I call you my most intimate friends for I reveal to you everything that I've heard from my father that is from the passion translation and there's a beautiful hymn that I grew up on it says and he walks with me and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I come to the garden alone because I want to meet my friend. But what do you do when your friend goes silent? And that's what I'm speaking about tonight. I wrestle with, what do I want to say? It is so easy for me to say, he is a healer. He is trustworthy. He is freedom. He is. And I could have just said, period. But what about when he is silent? And you're desperate for him. And you're longing for him. And you need a word from him. And he is silent. Imagine it, ladies. You go to call your girlfriend. You go to call your boyfriend. You expect them to answer the phone, and they don't. And maybe a day goes by, and you just feel like, okay, well, maybe we're just kind of playing phone tag. But multiple days go by, and you hear nothing from your friend. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight, ladies. And what do you do? in the silent moments of your life? How do you overcome in the silent moments of your life? And so if you have your Bibles, we are going to be reading from Daniel 10. Because this happened to Daniel. He found himself in a situation where he was asking and questioning God, and God was silent. And it was weeks before he heard anything from the Lord. So let me give a little bit of background because I don't want to take it for granted that everyone knows the story of Daniel. But Daniel, if you have read any type of children's story, Daniel was the one who found himself in the lion's den because he refused to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar. You remember that story? And so when he refused to bow down, what happened was they threw him into the lion's den. And thank God that he got him out of there safely. And so Daniel often had visions. And so this is believed in Daniel 10 that he is ha having one of the last visions that he's going to have. King Nebuchadnezzar, who was a wicked king, is no longer in rule, but King Cyrus is. And so Daniel is asking God, this vision troubles me. 
what does this mean? And so he is asking for God to give him an answer. And it made me think about my daughter. And she's a teenager. She's 17, soon to be 18. And she likes to be in her room. How many of you have teenagers? Right? So they're at that phase in their life where, you know, they don't necessarily always want to be around us. They want to be in their room. And that's fine, right? Like they're becoming independent. That's what we want. We want to be able to raise them and push them out and not take them back. <laughs> so we have stairs in our home. And so if I'm at the bottom of the stairs, I don't know if how many of you have two stories. I don't necessarily always want to go up the stairs. So I'll be like, Hannah. <laughs> and she doesn't answer. And so then, in, in true Renee form, Hannah! Still doesn't answer, right? Because she's probably got her headset in or whatever the case may be. I don't believe she's intentionally ignoring me. But then... I draw closer, right? So now I'm yelling from the bottom of the steps, but I go up like maybe five steps and I yell a little bit more. And then if I still don't get her, I walk up to the, the next step and I'm still yelling. I don't know why I'm still yelling. Like, why don't I just walk to her room, knock on the door and say, hey, come on, I need you. But what I'm trying to demonstrate is that when we find ourselves in the silent moments of our lives, we cannot walk away from our relationships because of one silent moment. We can't abandon our relationships because of one silent moment. And so let's take a look at Daniel 10, and we have it on a slide in case you don't have your Bible. Verse 2. It says, at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. And so as he is asking God to give him some understanding about this vision, and he's asking God, he is doing some very important things. He's not eating food, so I have to believe that that is pointed out because he is fasting. It says no choice food. So maybe he doesn't give up everything, but he's giving up what he loves. And then it says no meat or wine. That kind of speaks for itself. Now, I don't know why the Bible decides to point out that he wore no lotion. I don't know that I'm going to make that commitment to try to hear from Jesus, but that's what Daniel felt like he needed to do was not have on any lotion. And as I've been preparing, I have been fasting and I have been praying, but I said, Lord, now I got to put on some lotion because I do not need these ladies thinking I got on a white shirt because my brown skin is ashy. <laughs> and so verse 4 says, and you don't, this isn't up there, it says, on the 24th day, so for three weeks, he's been petitioning Jesus. He's been petitioning God. And it says, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, finally, the Lord speaks. And so let's go down to verse 12 and 14. 
And so he sees this vision. He actually encounters. They, in the Bible, it says, if you read those other verses, you can read it on your own time. It says an angel of the Lord. Um, I did a lot of research. And so some were saying, you know, maybe this was a vision of Jesus. All we know is that it was an angel of the Lord. And verse 12 says, then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Verse 14, now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. And so, ladies, what I wanted to just share with you is that there will be moments in your life where God is silent. Or maybe you are so distracted by the noise in the marketplace that he really is speaking, but his whispers are at a tone where you're only going to hear them if you are in his presence. And so a year and a half ago, I wasn't like Daniel. I didn't pray. I didn't fast to the degree that he did when my trouble came. I woke up on a morning, a Saturday morning, in the worst pain of my life. Actually, I was supposed to be on this stage for a Freedom Encounter, to speak for the Freedom Encounter. And I remember texting Kristen, I'm headed to the hospital. And in true Renee fashion, I'm like, even if I have to have the ER bracelet on, I will speak. I will be on that stage. I never made it to the stage. Now, I was released. And I went home, they said, you know, look, we found a little something on your ovary, you need to follow up with your doctor on Monday, and they gave me some drugs. And from Saturday until Sunday, something started happening in my body. And I have a picture, and I never want to forget this picture because I have a scar on my forehead, because what I didn't realize is that I thought that I was just sleeping on and off, but what was really happening was that I was going in and out of consciousness. And so I cried out to my husband, I said, hey, I need to go to the bathroom. And so he walked me into the bathroom, and the next thing I remember is him standing over me yelling, Renee, Renee. And that scar was from where I had hit the corner of the door as I fell and passed out. And so I would have these moments when I would feel a little better, and I told my husband, I said, gone ahead, take Jordan to the baseball field. They were in a tournament. They had lost every single game the day before. They won't be gone long. And so <laughs> it was just Hannah and I. They won the tournament. And so there I was with my daughter, and she was supposed to go to a meeting, and I said, Hannah, you can go. And she says, Mommy, you just don't look good. And so my mom FaceTimed me. And when she saw that face, she knew I needed to get to the emergency room. I don't remember much about that day, but there are a couple memories that I have. One of my daughter crying, and I remember saying, I will be okay. I remember hearing the paramedics say, we are losing her. Because the thing on, their, on my ovary had ruptured, and I was hemorrhaging to death. And so I get past that, I have emergency surgery, I have blood transfusions, and I'm, my mom was right by my side. 
and I'm 46 years old, but when you find yourself in need, there is nothing like your mother. She never left my side. She stayed with me overnight because, of course, my husband had to be there with the kids. And so there I go to a follow-up, and I'm thinking I'm just going to hear, okay, everything is good, but they said, okay, we need you to go to another doctor. There's some information with regard to the pathology report. And so they booked the appointment, and what I didn't know was the pathology report led me to an oncologist. And so I sit down. I don't even take my husband because I'm just thinking like, okay, I'm healed. I just need these stitches to be, you know, in, in perfect order, and I'm going to go about my business. And so she says, all right, it's stage one, and we need to do this, and we need to do that. And I'm like, what? And she was like, you had not heard that diagnosis yet. And I said, no. And she was like, okay, well, you have been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And we need to do a whole bunch of stuff. And so in that moment, I was crying out to God. And ladies, it was some of the darkest days of my life. And I tried to put on a happy face. And God said, I want you to share just a, a couple of pages of your journal. And this was on December 28th. I was surrounded by family. I had just been diagnosed. Every Christmas, we rent a house, and we were all together. And I was laughing on the outside. I actually think I even have a picture. And I was laughing on the outside. But I was dying on the inside. And nobody knew it. And I wasn't sleeping at night. And on December 28, 2018, I said, today I find out the test results from my blood work and my CT scan. And last night was rough. I'm anxious and I'm nervous. And I feel like everything that could go wrong is going wrong. But in the midst, I try and encourage myself, but I just feel the same. Look, I know what the words say. I know what this says, but when you find yourself in a place when you are in a silent moment, it's hard to lean on this word without feeling some sense of fear and anxiety. I said, in the midst, I try and encourage myself, but I just feel the same feelings again and again. And I, and I woke up early, and I, I read my word, but I couldn't focus. And when I got in the shower, I said, enough is enough. And I decreed and I declared that my body is cancer-free. And I decreed it and I declared it because in Job it says, if we decree a thing and we declare a thing, it shall be established. And I believed it, even though I didn't feel it. And so when we say he is a miracle worker, and even though I don't see it, he's working. And even though I don't feel it, he's working, ladies. And so I left out of that shower, and I felt encouraged, and I was ready. But two days later, December 30th, these past few days, I have really struggled with worry and anxiety. And there I was again, worrying, fearful. I said, the frustrating part is I know better. I know God's word. I know what it says. I know what God has promised over my life. And I stand on these promises for my dear life, God. I decree and I declare a spirit of peace over me. At this point, it wasn't about healing. I'm like, God, I need peace. I need to sleep at night. And when I went to the doctor on December 28th, I found out that there was an 
undescribable spot on my other ovary and they don't know if it's cancer or not. So for that reason, they are scheduling surgery for January 31st. And I think the, the, the beautiful conference was like February 1st. And I put, I'm looking forward to 2019. I know there is God's glory and greatness on the other side of this journey. Ladies, I just got to be real, right? Hosanna, Joyce. A lot of us, we go through hell to be on this stage to encourage you to be the light that you need in your darkness, in your silent moments. So let's look at what Daniel did. Because I'm going to break this down. Because when you read the word of God, you can't just read words. You got to dissect it. First of all, when the Lord stepped in, it says, do not be afraid. It says, since the first day, underline that, highlight it, underline it. It says, since the first day. Can you imagine if what you wanted took place from the first day? That when I call somebody, they pick up the phone on the first ring. Or... When I go to eat Carabas, I'm the first in line. <laughs> or when I yell to my daughter, she answers on the first time. And that's what God said here. It says, since the first day that you set your mind. So I'm going to give you three things, ladies, that when you are in your silent moments, these three things are going to change your world. All right, we ready? Balcony, we ready? All right, because I know, look, y'all just had Carabas. It's been a long day. So I, I need y'all talking back to me so I know you're not sleeping. Okay, so it says, first of all, Set your mind, right? That's what it says. Since the first day that you set your mind, Daniel set his mind on God. He prayed. He fasted, right? Because the word of God says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and then everything else comes on, all right? So that's number one. Set your mind. Number two, it says, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding, Daniel wanted to know. And it is okay to ask God and to want to know why. But here's the thing, ladies. In your quest for knowledge, be very careful not to dictate to God your expected outcome because he's going to do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants because he is sovereign. So he desired to gain understanding. That's why in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it tells us not to lean to our own understanding. Third, it says, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself. Now, I had to look that up because I said, well, Lord, what is humble? And it says, when I looked it up, it says, showing a modest or low estimate of one's importance or ability. You're not proud. You're not haughty. You're not arrogant. You're not assertive. But you're reflective and you're expressive. And you are giving glory to God and not yourself. That is what it means to be humble. You're not walking around in pride. And so that is what Daniel showed. And so it says, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself, and I told you it was three things, 
but I'm giving you an, ac an extra bonus. There's four things. It says, humble yourself before God. That means you spend some time in his presence. It says, every since then that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And that's the good news, ladies. That when you call out to God, he hears your words. And the answer may be delayed, right? If you read that as we just read it, the answer was delayed because there was a spiritual battle that took place. But if you just hold on, when I used to grow up, they would say to God's unchanging hand, hold to his hand, God's unchanging hand. And it says, build your hopes on things eternal. Because when you build your hopes on things eternal, this little stuff we're dealing with, it fades away in the presence of our majestic and sovereign and loving and kind God. And so when he is silent, you bow down in his presence. You lay prostrate before him. And so, ladies, I want to share with you I am not in the place that I was a year ago. My journal from December 10th, 2019, so just a little bit ago, even though we're almost in March, it says, I'm free. <laughs> That's what I wrote. I said, I'm free. I said, no more chains are holding me. I will trust the report of the Lord. My soul is rested. It is such a blessing. And I said, for months I have battled fear and anxiety, but not today, devil. And it didn't, it didn't even matter that it wasn't necessarily the report that I wanted. I knew on this day I had chosen faith over fear. I says, when I got home, I cried because there wasn't fear and there wasn't anxiety and I trust God and today the enemy was defeated and I will trust the report of the Lord and my sister who I talked to multiple times a day I remember when I was getting ready to go into the last surgery that I had to remove my last ovary she says Renee are you surrendered and it I was angry that she had asked me that question. And I said, Rosalind, I don't even know what surrender is. I am getting ready to go into another surgery, and I don't know what surrender is. And ladies, surrender comes after a battle. Because what happens no one goes into the battle waving the white flag of surrender. It comes after you have fought. And you can't fight anymore. And so I'm not saying tomorrow the fear will be gone and the anxiety will be gone. And yes, God is able to do that. But what I'm saying is if God is silent, you keep praying. You keep trusting. You keep worshiping. 
I would go to bed at night and I would allow the word of God to penetrate. I would just play the word of God. I wanted to hear the word of God. I wanted to snuggle with the word of God. I wanted to sleep with the word of God. I needed it in my car. I needed it in the shower. I needed it at my bedside. I needed it at my office. I saturated myself in the word of God. And ladies, might I just challenge you to do the same because he's a good, good father. He's a good, good father, ladies, and we are free. And I'm just going to pray and then Kristen's going to come up. I'm just going to close us in prayer. Father God, we just thank you, Father God, for your awesome ability. Thank you that you are healer. Thank you, Father God, that you are silent because it's in those silent, silent moments, God, that we're going to wrestle in your presence, that we're going to snuggle with you and that we're going to talk with you and we're going to be with you, Father God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we overcome the enemy by the word of our testimony and the blood of the lamb and as I have given my testimony as you have unctioned me to do Lord may it touch the hearts of your women for the woman who is single married divorced for the woman who maybe just got a report like I did or maybe her spouse got a report like I did for the woman with the wayward child, for the woman who has a son or daughter sitting in prison. Meet them at their needs. We decree it, we declare it, and it shall be established in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. amen.